Let's start with the first speaker, Simon Martin. He is currently research fellow at the British School at Rome, at the adjunct lecturer at the Trinity College Rome campus. He has published several works on sports history, the fascist era, and the legacies of fascism. I would like to mention two award-winning books of his, Sports Italia, the Italian love affairs with sport, published in 2011, and Football and Fascism, the national game under Mussolini, published in 2004. He has worked with BBC, CNN, La Storia, and published in Guardian Online, The Independent Online, Il Venerdì di Repubblica, and Italy magazine. His forthcoming book deals with the myth and memory of Giovanni Berta, the squadrista killed in 1921 and turned into a fascist martyr's legend. The title of his presentation is Giovanni Berta, Political Violence and the Mobilization of the Martyr. Welcome, Simon. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, take that up. Uh, thank you, Madalena. Um, thanks, Marla, for inviting me, and thanks to the Academy for putting on this uh, putting on this event. Um, I, I'm very happy because this morning, uh, listening to the papers, I think there was some. There were, I was a bit worried about this paper yesterday. I wasn't sure whether it connected too well to some of the the excellent things we heard yesterday. But and maybe it still does anyway. But today, um, I, I can see a lot more connections, or I'm make, beginning to make them, what some of the things that were said this morning. Um, this paper comes, uh, this, this book really, this project's come out, my, really comes out of my PhD uh, on football and fascism. I just said to Madalena that, that football and fascism had, a, had one page on Giovanni Berta, and this project here is going to have one page on football. Um, and it, that says quite a lot about him, really, because I missed the... I kind of missed something that was really obvious. I went with the uh, with the standard story of this martyr in that in that book. So what I'm trying to do with this, what I try to do with the book now is is to tell that story. Um, and what I want to do here today is to think about some of the issues we've been talking about and the ways in which the, that his memory uh, was used politically um, and perhaps what the the long term impacts of that were within the regime and maybe perhaps running on and connecting to some of the things we've heard. So Giovanni Berta, first of all, who was he? Um, he was uh, he was the son of a small iron foundry owner in Florence. He was born in 1896. Uh, at the age of 18 he joined the uh, Italian Navy. He was an apprentice gunner for a term of around six years. He saw action in the Adriatic campaign between 1915 and 1918. In 1919, he was demobilized. Um, he returned to work in the office of his father's iron foundry, the Fonderia delle Cure, which later became the Fonderia delle Cure Giovanni Berta. Berta died on the evening of the 28th of February 1921. He was 26 years of age. Um, the night that he died, or the afternoon evening that he died, was... Um, there had been around 36 hours, maybe 48 hours, with quite extreme violence in Florence. Akin, if you read the reports, very much akin to civil war within the city. This was a result of an attack upon a nationalist, um, a bomb attack upon a nationalist parade the previous morning, in which there were a couple of deaths um, at the time, one later on. And the assassination, as a reprisal that evening, of the... Uh, a leading local communist and, and trade union figure, uh, Spartago Lavagnini, he was assassinated by fascists who, uh, as he was preparing the, the newspaper for that, for the next day, they shot him in the, in the head four or five times, put him back in his editor's chair, and as the rumor, the story was, one of the fascists removed the cigarette from their mouth and put it back in, in the mouth of Spartago Lavagnini. So this was a, an extraordinarily violent um, murder. Um, Berta, um, so that's the context to his, to his death. Now we don't really, uh, the facts around his death have never been ascertained. We don't really know what happened. 
Um, I was hoping to find to try to find something more conclusive about that. I, I didn't I didn't do that. Um, but what fascism very quickly dis declared was that this was an act of martyrdom. Um, what it might have been was quite simply a terrible accident in many ways. I think there's no doubt that he comes under attack. Um, but we, there may have been no intent to kill him. We don't know. I don't know. What we do know is that he was 26 years of age. He drowned in the Ardno in Florence beneath the Ponte di Sospeso. Um, so I think thinking about something that John was saying earlier, something what I tried to do in, in, in this book to, to always to keep present was the fact that he also was a victim, whether he was a fascist or not. So to try and, uh, try and think kind of impartially about, about, about the victims in many ways, because whilst he is, becomes this fascist hero, this fascist martyr, I think he is still, uh, he is still a victim in this story. Now his memory, um, and that of the act, uh, they were preserved and appropriated through a variety of fascist publications, um, through exhibitions, through uh, various toponomastic commemorations, through uh, drain covers that I've just showed on one of those images in Rome and in Florence, through the Florence Football Stadium, um, and also through his very high profile burial in the crypt um, of the fascist Fallen, the Fallen for the Fascist Revolution, which was instituted beneath Santa Croce, the Basilica of Santa Croce in Florence. So around his death, there are about three or four really key points, I think, about, or myths that emerge around his, around his death, which are really important to the story. Um, first is that he was, his, his attackers were communists. Um, it's a long story. It's quite likely that his attackers uh, came from the working class. There's no evidence that they were necessarily communists. Uh, and even if they were, there is no evidence that this attack upon him was politically motivated. Uh, secondly, um, the big story um, is about is this image at the bottom right about his hands. Um, because the really big emotive uh, part of this story is that as he's hanging from the bridge, the communists sever his hands, they cut off his hands and he falls into the Ardno. Um, this is not true. It's fake news. There's, there's, there's an autopsy report, and the autopsy report actually refers to some scratches on his hands, but his hands are perfectly intact. But this becomes a fundamental part of the story. Thirdly, he's frequently presented as the first fascist martyr. This is never questioned, um, and it's never proven by fascist sources. Um, there are certainly other fascists who die before him within the city. There are other fascists who die before him within Italy. Um, so uh, it's odd that he becomes venerated as Italy's number one martyr. And closely connected to this, the fourth myth is that of his fascist affiliation. Uh, in practice, again, um, his fascist membership, sympathies or otherwise are impossible to ascertain. Now, establishing his membership with the movement um, is, is, or otherwise, it's less important to, uh, than actually the myth that was created around him. So it's the myth of this alleged uh, murder by communists, it's to that what, what I want to turn and what I want to focus on. And I want to do that by um, looking at the, the presentation, the mass communication uh, and the politicization of this, of this myth around his death through um, four, four images of which I think can relate to four um, different ways in which his death is exploited. So I think the first really important thing about the, the images, uh, or, or this first image about him, uh, which I kind of look at it as, as one of the key things around his death was the demonization of the enemy, the demonization of anti-fascists and communists. Um, so I think there's two key things to this particular image that give it power. Um, firstly, it's the emphasis upon his youth. Berta was 26. I look at this image and I think I've put this boy, uh, adolescent, maybe around 16, perhaps. Um, that's my reading of it. He's certainly much younger than Berta. So I think that there's a part of a message here which is definitely drawing upon his childlike innocence, almost perhaps in a suggestion, arguably, of fantasy, fant infanticide. So this obviously um, exaggerates the barbarity of his opponents. Now, also very importantly is that this, this line at the bottom, beneath the words uh, Italiani di Cordati, so remember, don't forget, um, are the first lines from this uh, very famous song uh, at the time, um, Anno ammazzato Giovanni Berta. So they've killed Giovanni Berta, the son of war profiteers, long live the communist um, who cut off his hands. Now, this image here um, 
is, well, that's from a song that apparently um, communists were singing at the time. This image is actually from um, fascist party uh, electoral propaganda in 1924, election or a, a plebiscite, as we might like to uh, refer to it. So what this is actually doing, rather than celebrating the communists, um, this is actually reminding everybody uh, of this barbarous attack. This is reminding people, uh, the electorate, of what happened. This is telling them this is what communists do. They cut off his hands. So it's very much about reminding of the adversary's barbarity. Now, fascist squads also, they sang a lot. Songs were very important. They sang to uh, augment the threat of the enemy, to create fear, to develop courage uh, prior to their actions, to develop also a sense of legitimacy in what they were about to do. And Vendetta was at the, begin was at the core of many of the songs about Berta. So they proclaimed or, or, or promised the settling of scores. And these settling of scores, of scores were always so that Berta could, could rest in peace. So maximizing the barbarity of, of the of their opponents, that the, the fascist repetition of this song was, was crucial to the dehumanization um, of the anti-fascists, but also to the legitimization of the squadrista response. And legitimizing squadrismo is, is uh, where I want to turn with, the, with this following, following image, which was published in 1935 um, in a pamphlet which has a, uh, it's about 14 pages, it has one image and one page dedicated to martyrs from the cities of Padua, uh, Bologna, Milan, Genoa, uh, and Turin, and Berta naturally represents Florence. This image, I would argue, is perhaps rooted, its power is rooted in many ways in its portrayal of the, the true facts, um, in its apparent authenticity. Um, Berta's presented about, he looks about the right age on this occasion, he's wearing a brown suit, an overcoat, a scarf. Um, this is opposed to the olive colored suit that he's always reported to be wearing within the press. Um, but again, once again, we can now see his aggressors um, looming above him, brandishing knives and long metal spike. They, they look kind of roughly dressed. They contrast with Berta quite clearly. So there, there is a clear difference being, uh, being played out here. It, these images, what they are, they're all doing, they're capturing this very important moment of his martyrdom. So the moment that Berta clings onto the bridge as the blows um, begin to rain down and just before the moment when his hands are apparently severed. Now this is a constant trope throughout uh, fascist texts, the presentation of uh, anti-fascist, not only as, as barbarous, but also as unnatural as against, against nature. So by default, if anti-fascists were against nature, then, then, then squadrismo, the squadrista violence was legitimized. It was a legitimized as a defense against the threat that these inhuman, uh, against nature uh, adversaries uh, actually presented. They threatened the historical tradition, particularly in a city like Florence. And this in turn contrasts with, with, the, with the reinvigorating, the cleansing uh, activities that the squads were apparently uh, undertaking. They were bringing Italy, they were bringing, creating a rebirth amongst Italy and Italians. So this all creates, contributes to creating and supporting the idea that fascism uh, and fascist violence was bringing the, health, the city back to health, was bringing Italy back to health. Now, at the same time, whilst they worked very hard to maximize the apparent anti-fascist threat, the violence of the communists, attention was often drawn to their apparent cowardliness as well. So this is also indicated in, in the image by the outnumbering um, of Berta, the use of weapons against him, apparently unarmed. Uh, he was uh, apparently wearing a pistol. They don't find that on, on his corpse. So the hatred of the adversary was, was not just ideological. This was also based upon a perceived lack of heroism, courage, manliness, and a perceived lack of an ability to fight. And this contrasted with the very brave, courageous, violent um, squadrista. So presenting Berta's image, his murder in, in these images, this offers a really high profile um, opportunity, the spotlight, the barbarous, cowardly, uh, anti-national characteristics of fascist, fascists, fascism, socialist adversary. Now, it wasn't only socialist men who were demonized, socialist women were also demonized. Uh, they were portrayed as savage, and animalistic, barbarous, uh, diabolic, cannibals even on occasion. 
they were also presented um, as having no sense of what it meant to be a mother, because no real mother would put another mother through the pain of um, losing their son, if they actually understood what motherhood really meant. And this was quite clearly something that was very uh, important to the fascist regime. Now this third image is quite similar. Um, this is, um, again, fascist propaganda. This was dedicated to the old and glorious squadrismo and to the young fascist followers and the custodians of the bloodstained traditions. Uh, we can see this on, on the reserve, reverse image of this postcard, again, with uh, a key line from the earlier uh, mentioned song at the top there, Anno Ammazzato uh, Giovanni Berta. So, Well, I think where the power of this image is, I mean, we're looking at, if we're looking at this image, it's again quite realistic. He is on this occasion wearing his, his olive suit. Um, but the key difference in this image is these words at the bottom. Um, his cry, this is his moment of his, this is the moment of his martyrdom. And the final words of martyrs are obviously the moments of the, the moments of climax, the key, the really important, memorable part of the act. That's the bit what we, we have to record. So in Berta's moment, in Berta's martyrdom, it's this cry to his mother. Um, and it was very unusual for any account of the of his death to not refer to this critical moment. It was more than just a rhetorical detail to draw sympathy. Fascism uh, wanted to return women to the home. It wanted to restore uh, patriarchal authority. Uh, it wanted to confine women to child-bearing and child-raising roles. So whilst women would not occupy key leading roles within the, within the movement and the party, they were nonetheless very important as mobilisers. So female heroism was also uh, was principally expressed through um, and conducted through motherhood. So the mother's grief was now directed and given some sense. It was The message was quite clear, be strong. Um, their sacrifice, your son's sacrifice, has not been, has not been in, vain, in vain. So mothers become virtuous uh, examples by tolerating and suffering their, the heroics of the heroic loss of their sons in the name of the motherland, in the name of the patria. This was part of the mother's mission. So the emphasis upon his mother spotlights the, the, the expectation of the mother, the squadrista's mother, to stoically bear um, the burden and the risks that her son was taking in the name of the fascist revolution. So this nationalizes the act and Berta's murder in this case is transformed from one that was no longer just against him and fascism, but it was one against the motherland, against the female figure of Italia, the Mater Dolorosa. And the Virgin Mary in many ways is, the, is a key example for fascist mothers to, to follow. She was strong, stoic, and able to un withstand the most uh, acute pain and suffering and, and, and enduring in the name of the Patria. Um, by doing this, that her, her support and her courage was essential if her fascist son was to go about his job, was to go about his violent role of putting down and defeating communism. And that brings us to, to the final image that I want to look at, this quite striking um, submission by the artist Ezio Buscio uh, to the 1936 Venice Biennale. And the Biennale was uh, in 1936, this is driven by the domestic uh, and the international context following the Italian invasion of Abyssinia. So the 1936 Biennale becomes very, very propagandistic. Now, whilst, whilst the artist Boucher doesn't express directly Berta's final cry to his mother. I think it's quite implicit here in many, in many ways. Um, this image of the sacrifice of Christ naturally refers also to, to the Virgin Mary's grief, and thus to all Italian mothers whose sons had died for the revolution. So what's happening here is quite, it's quite obvious in many ways. It's an, an invocation of Christ, and the invocation of Christ is obviously the most important martyrological tradition. It required that martyrs consequently be portrayed as, as Christly as possible. Uh, and he's, he does that quite clearly here. So this is the source of the image's power. Um, it remains very close to the Christian tradition, something which the audience would have been very, very familiar with. This is a consistent feature 
um, of the literature of the early church, that of suffering, persecution, the death of an individual, uh, being understood in terms of the sufferings of, of the Saviour. So this image interprets that and it gives a different reading of it. It's, it's unmistakable. Once again, hanging from the bridge, um, Bertha's very muscular, he's bare chested as Jesus is generally portrayed only in crucifixion scenes. Um, he has crossed feet, there are no stigmata, but he also has this kind of uh, classical concave stomach as well. So if we look at him, where, where the image is quite interesting is he has this loincloth around kind of covering his dignity. Um, and this also passes up behind his shoulders and over his left arm, because if we look at it quite casually, it seems as if both of his, both of his hands have actually been severed. Um, but he's still actually hanging on by his left, uh, by his left hand, while his right hand has quite clearly been, um, quite clearly been severed. Now, if we look at his face, in, there's very little evidence of the unimaginable pain, the shock that would have, um, he would have been experiencing uh, having his hand severed. Um, his upward gaze towards the assassin is quite peaceful. It's almost, a ple almost an expression of pleasure and relief. So this image, or this imitation of Christ, it sanctifies Bertha. Uh, it affirms his apparent courage, his apparent goodness, and the road to glory. Now, the painter and critic, Cipriano Ephesia Opos, review and analysis of Bouchot's work, um, this sustains many of the principal myths that are associated with Bertha's death. So in the bottom right, Oppo talks about the three furies, the three furies from uh, Greek mythology. Um, goddesses of vengeance and retribution, they meted out justice to unpunished criminals and crimes against the natural order, which clearly fits the story about Berta. They are exhibiting emotions of rage, horror, fear. Um, they're quite modern, these two women in the front. Um, but they, and they're often, in classical images, portrayed as kind of old hags, kind of witch-like characters with snake hair. But the one in the front there kind of has this snake hair uh, reference to, to reinforce Oppo's connection. Now, they're often seen in threes. It initially appears that there's only two here, but just behind the two at the front, we see another kind of more um, older, more traditional kind of figure of one of the Furies. Prostrate on the bridge above Berta, which is again clearly um, identified by the X shape. Every image always has this crossed X of the, of the kind of balcony of the bridge. This makes it very, very identifiable. Um, above him is Berta's demonic, bestial, knife-wielding assassin. He's caught in the act. He, he's quite clearly the, the devil incarnate. Um, below, at the bottom left, we see a fascist. Uh, identifiable by the skull and crossbones of the, of the Ardito on his, of the Arditi on his belt, the fascist uh, or the First World War crack uh, military force. Um, he is exacting revenge on a similarly demonic figure with um, apparently great with great calm. So going beyond the more direct and, and customary image of the fascist martyr, Berta's crucifixion um, by these demonic socialists represents an attack not just upon fascism but upon the entire Italian Christian community. Um, it focuses, uh, it fuses, sorry, the mutilated body of the heroic fascist with that of Christ, with the nation and the church. His sacrificed body is, is empowered to reunite and regenerate the nation. He redeems the sins of socialism. And at the same time, he brings the god of the kingdom of fascism, Mussolini, down to earth. So by directly comparing Berta's death with that of Jesus, the image provides a model um, of endurance in the face of perceived hostility and aggression. It further consequently justifies the strong fascist response and it warns of the need to be in a permanent state of readiness to fight the fascism. So martyrs are quite, uh, were clearly important to the fascist movement for a variety of reasons and Berta, as arguably the number one martyr, was, was, was crucial. The press reports at the time and the literary accounts of his life and death set the story. They also bring a really strong, violent language into, uh, the, into the mainstream. But these, vis these types of visual images, material culture, uh, were essential also to the long-term propaga propagation and dissemination of messages surrounding fascist martyrs. They transmit power at the same time um, as they also transmit the trauma of these events. So among these images, um, Berta's representation was clearly critical in its ability to draw attention to anti-fascist barbarity. 
to create the impression of fascism's oppression and consequently of its legitimacy. Thus, this would keep the Italians in a high state of alert. It displayed the courage and commitment of fascism of the first hour, the very first fascists, and this would be called upon invoked throughout the years of fascist rule. It would also, also show stoicism and faith in fascist martyrs, uh, in their ideology, and also in their god. These images also were very highly important in terms of mobilizing support in general, but in the case of Berta, very specifically in the terms of the mobilization of mothers and the gendering of grief. Mothers, women were expected to be stoic and accept grief. Men were expected to go out and seek vengeance. So mixing this new martyrdom cult with established devotional images and practices, this gives fresh meaning and significance to also to existing traditions that were very deeply ingrained and recognisable within Italian society. So there is also the potential in images like this to, to engage not only fascists, but also the Catholic audience. And by identifying fascism with the motherland, um, the fascist martyr representations construct uh, an image that ex also excluded the adversary from the nation. By default, what this does is it turns fascist victims also into national martyrs. So the martyrdom of Berta was used um, at the time to contribute to the, de the destabilization of the state and its overthrow initially. Thereafter, it is used to maintain society in a high state of alert or in a high state of fear. It depends on which side of the fence you happen to be. It certainly mobilized individuals into action, or it was trying to mobilize individuals into action, or if not, into benevolent neutrality. And thus, as part of the new fascist cults of the dead, the cult of the martyrs, it contributes to fascism's attempt to manufacture consent, and thus to the regime's longevity. Thank you.